Is that, that heaven gets excited when people follow Jesus. When people uh, make a decision to follow Jesus, heaven gets excited. And the third thing is that what makes Jesus jump around? What makes Jesus get out of his seat? And he told the story of Stephen, where Stephen, what did Stephen do? He gave up his whole life. He was willing to, to die for Jesus. And it says that Jesus, it, it describes Jesus as sitting on his throne many times in Scripture. And there, in this account of Stephen, it says that Jesus got up out of his seat. He stood up as he watched Stephen uh, go all out for him. And so uh, I want to encourage you to... to, 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 to Watch that message again, listen to that message again, and process through what God is speaking to us as a body, that we need to be a church that gets excited about the things that heaven gets excited about, that get excited about the things that get Jesus excited about. And I believe we're heading in a really great direction. We're going to turn this morning to Matthew chapter 5. We're working through the Sermon on the Mount together as a family. There is so much good things in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I have calendared it out. I don't even know how long you know, we'll be in this, but it's just like every scripture as I go through, I think about <coughs> four or five more things to teach on. And so this morning, I'm going to try to condense it, control it, like, like focus a little bit, but there's there in two verses that we're going to look at today, there is so much rich goodness to go through. And so uh, two weeks ago, last time I spoke, we looked at Matthew chapter 5, and we're in chapter, verse 21 and 22. And in verse 21 and 22, it focused on uh, our anger. And Jesus, again, he's, he makes these statements. He says, some of you have heard it was said this way, but I say to you this. And he's Oh, specifically about murder, but he said he equated our anger, and especially our angry outburst, our emotional outburst, uh, he equated that with murder. And I said, that week I said, wow, I think many of us in this room may be guilty of murder, myself included. And I have to confess, as your pastor, I am still working on this. That afternoon, I let my emotions get the best of me and said some words to Denver, and I was like, all right, Jesus, work on me. Help me out. But our words have the power of life and death. And, and in that, that message, Jesus encouraged us, don't put yourself in the judgment seat. That's what he said about saying, you fool. Um, cursing somebody's soul. Making a verdict upon them that Christ himself has not made. And I encourage us that our words, even our words said in extreme emotion, they matter. We can't just say, oh, I was just angry and dismiss what we say. But there is sometimes work to be done in those moments when we have spoken angry words, when we have uh, uh, acted in anger towards others, that we need to go back and repair. And so that's what we're going to look at here now in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, it reads this way. It says this, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, to be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift to God. It's essential. One of the things that I was thinking about as I was looking at this passage of Scripture, and, and particularly uh, as I look through uh, all of chapter 5, it's essential to understand in Scripture that God exists in relationship. We see this theme throughout all of Scripture, and especially as we begin to look this week, uh, we're going to continue this conversation on anger, uh, we're going to... Uh, look in the next couple weeks about lust. We're going to look uh, about. Uh, we're going to look into marriage. We're going to look into uh, our relationship with our enemies and with our neighbors. Uh, and, and you see this theme throughout all the scriptures that that God exists in relationship, and therefore He creates in relationship, and His rules are to maintain relationship. God desires to be in communion with us because God exists in communion. He exists in relationship. 
I was traveling through Kentucky this week and Denver. I mean, I don't know how he thinks about all this kind of stuff, but he started asking questions about the Trinity. And he started asking, you know, how does this all work together? Like that we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How does this all work? And in the car, Rachel and I were doing our best uh, talking about the different analogies of what it means that God is one, but he exists in three persons. Uh, but God, as he exists in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they work interdependently upon each other in love. And so when we talk about love through song, or we talk about the gospel and, and love, or we talk about marriage here shortly uh, in a few weeks, and talk about how God encouraged us to love our spouse as he loved the church, what did he do? Love exists by, by thinking about and acting towards the other's best interest at my greatest expense. And so we see here an understanding or having, having to have a grip of this understanding that God exists in love. He created us, uh, sorry, he exists in relationship. He created us in relationship, man and female, able to relate one another. And the rules that he sets up, his commands and his teaching, they maintain relationship. And so here in Matthew chapter 5, with that understanding in our background, here in chapter 5, we see this scenario of somebody coming to worship. And in Matthew chapter 5, it specifically is speaking of offerings. And so we, we see this offering to God. It was part before Christ became the perfect sacrifice. Right? We know that Jesus came and he established himself. He lived perfectly, fully submitted to the Father, and he became perfect the perfect sacrifice. And in Hebrews, it teaches us that he became the sacrifice once and for all. But as Jesus was writing this in Matthew, or speaking this in Matthew chapter 5, he was speaking to an audience who were still accustomed to going to the, uh, going to the altar, having the Levites, the priests, uh, the religious leaders to go and make sacrifices, making offerings. They were accustomed to bringing lambs and doves uh, to be offered to the Lord. And this was a sacrifice to God. But what Jesus began to speak about here is that the Jewish uh, followers would be really faithful. They would know the calendar. They would know the celebrations. They would know exactly what to bring uh, and offer to the Lord. However, their life was messed up. They had odd against their brother. They had situations going on around them. Their, their lives didn't look pure, but they were doing the right things. They were making the right sacrifices. When we come to worship God, whether it be Sunday morning, or as I'm going to introduce maybe a new thought, uh, and when we worship God with all of our life, it, it matters the trail of bad relationships that is in our wake. God is a God who exists in relationship. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He creates us in relationship, and it does matter the relation no status of the people that we are around. When we have anger, when we have broken relationships around us, it, it does matter to God. At least three times in the Old Testament, Jesus rejects their worship. He rejects, or God, sorry, rejects their worship due to their conduct of their life. So we see this uh, first, I, I was looking at 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. And in 1 Samuel 15, 22, Jesus, uh, sorry, the, the scripture comes and speaks to Samuel, and he makes it very clear that, to Samuel, that obedience is better than sacrifice. 
And to listen to God, to be obedient to God, and to listen to God in all of our life is better than, uh, it says here, the fat of rams. And to us, maybe in 21st century, we're like, okay, who cares about the, the fat of rams? But it was, it was a precious thing. It was a valuable sacrifice to bring uh, the fat of the ram, to bring the, the best cow, to bring the best uh, of the meat to, to God. And so Jesus, uh, so God instructs Samuel in 1 Samuel 15, 22. He says, hey, you know, obedience in your everyday life is far more important, is better than the best sacrifice that you can think of doing. I'm going to go and get into in a little bit what that means for us and maybe in the 21st century, what we think our best is for God. Maybe Denver dressing up really nice and getting all fancy. I want to present my best for God. No, obedience in every area of our life is better than the greatest sacrifice. In Amos, another Old Testament prophet, in Amos chapter 5, verses 18 through 24, God also mentions, he says he decrees or he rejects those Israelites who seek us, uh, who seek the day of the Lord. They, they give offerings and they give sacrifices despite their perpetuating injustices. And God says that he would re continue to reject their sacrifices. He would continue to reject their offerings until justice flowed and righteousness becomes like a mighty stream in their life. So all of these Israelites over and over again, they find themselves, they, they, they're like, all right, we're going to bring the best to God. I'm going to try to bring the best offering. I'm going to sacrifice the most. I'm going to out-sacrifice my neighbor. But, she, the, but God begins to speak to them in these moments and say, you know what? It's not about the best sacrifice. It's not about making the biggest offering. It's about your life and how you live. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 10 through 20, begins to describe again that God could no longer tolerate their sacrifices because of the consistent pursuit of injustices in their life. <clears throat> the way that they lived their life didn't match up with their great sacrifice that they had. In, in, Isaiah's, uh, in, in Isaiah, they would talk about how they treated the poor, how they treated their neighbor, how they uh, got in conflict all the time. God is concerned with how we relate to others. And when we think about our worship to Him, when we think about our offering, when we think about our sacrifice to Him, it matters how we relate with those who are around us. How we live with our family, each other, and our neighbors matters as we worship. <laughs> Remember this, Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, right? In our current 21st century uh, understanding of this, Jesus now has become the ultimate sacrifice. He has lived perfectly submitted to the Father. He did everything he saw the Father doing. He never did anything outside of God's will. And because of that, now we can sing of His grace or His mercy. He lived that way for us. He went to the cross and died on the cross for our sins. And the Bible teaches in, in Romans that because of the way that we live apart from God's will, we deserve death. And that's the death that Jesus got. He lived perfectly. He paid the penalty that we owe so that we can have a relationship with the Father. So that we, again, can be reconciled in relationship. But Romans chapter 12 introduces another thought about our life. Romans chapter 12. Let's look there together. Verses 1 and 2, it says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, 
holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So in this occasion, in Matthew chapter 5, we find Jesus speaking specifically to an audience that is accustomed to going to God on a regular basis, presenting an offering, presenting a, a sacrifice to Him, so that they, their sins may be cleansed, so that they can praise Him, so that they can, uh, so, so that they can be in right standing with them. And, and Jesus says in that moment, as they're offering and they find something wrong, they can go. But after Jesus comes to the cross, now we see in Romans chapter 12 an introductory of this thought that everything that we do is an offering to the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you by the mercy of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice. So now these moments of worship, I love to refer to our Sunday morning uh, worship uh, experiences. I, I tend to call these gatherings. We gather together to worship God. But if we take to heart Romans chapter 12, it tells us that everything we do, our life that we live, is a sacrifice to God. Everything I do is. Every moment of my life, every situation with my son, every situation at work, every situation with my neighbor, all that I do is a living sacrifice to God. And sometimes when I examine that, I think, of my, I think for a second, and my sacrifice doesn't always look so pretty. I don't know about yours. And so Jesus' is, is instructions here is this encouragement again that obedience to him is better than these moments of sacrifice because he's, uh, he's coming with the understanding that all of our life is worship to God. All of our life is an offering to the Lord. I mentioned what does it look like in the 21st century, I, I believe, you know, uh, that we, we try our hardest to make Sunday morning something we attend, or, or I don't know about you guys, but you got that U version Bible app, and how many times I can string together uh, consecutive days of reading the Word, or, or how many times do I get to listen to that beautiful Christian music, or, or how, how many times do I, you know, dress properly for God. He, he's saying, no, it's not these moments of sacrifice, it's not these moment of, of doing that is going to get you this beautiful relationship with the Father. No, it's every moment of our day, every action that we do, it is all worship to the Lord. Obedience in everyday life is better than momentary sacrifice. Your attendance record, Bible reading plan completion, the size of your gift on Sunday mornings, it doesn't equate to beautiful worship unless all of our life is lived in obedience to the Father. So today, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, he includes our relationships as an act of worship. You cannot expect your relationship with God to be properly maintained while you remain unreconciled with hostility towards others. That's what Jesus is speaking to us this morning in Matthew 23 through 24. We, we can't on the outside, maintain this good-looking sacrifice, this good-looking relationship with the Father, and live with a wake of broken relationships around us. In Scripture, God says that when we come to worship and you have something, or you know somebody else has something against you, you need to go to them and make it right. This is a beautiful thing. 
Just as the Father in heaven, there was a broken relationship that existed between us and the Father. And what did he do? He's not asking us this morning in Matthew 25, or Matthew chapter 5 to do something that he hasn't done first. And that's a beautiful thing about God. When I think about the things that he asked me to do, I can always see a correlating way that God has done the same thing towards me or the same way that he exists. When he asked me to give sacrificially, oh, I can see that through his son, he gave sacrificially. When I asked him, or when he asked me to live a life that is righteous, that is holy, that is according to his word, I can see in his scripture the way that God exists always in a, a state of holiness and righteousness. The way that Jesus lived day by day, submitted to the Father, he asked me the same way. So Jesus came, Christ came, and he made our relationship right with the Father. And now he asks you and I to do the exact same thing. In Matthew chapter 18, he began, Jesus began, uh, began to teach of how we can make relationships right. When I think about when, when I think of, uh, uh, was thinking about this sermon with or writing it out the message this morning, I I know the difficulty of what God is asking us to do in this moment. Because if we think about relationships, many times when we think about relationships and and, and even our, and especially our broken relationships, those relationships that, that are still in anger or those relationships that, that still anger us, there is a whole lot of emotion that we still carry about whatever has been done to us or whatever, whatever I did to them, right? If we, I, I want to open, preface the rest of this message as we're talking about the steps we need to take to make things right. I understand, and I believe Jesus also understands, that there is deep emotions that are behind these broken relationships. But even so, Jesus asks us again to be people of peace, to be peacemakers, to be ones who take steps toward reconciliation, towards wholeness in our relationships. Because remember, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus lays out the Beatitudes. He talks about what it means to be blessed, to be happy. And he said this, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. Our identity as followers of God are to be ones that are peacemakers, that work with everything, that pursue with everything within us to make peace, not only with us and the Father, but with others. And so Jesus repeating himself here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, he's re-emphasizing again this opportunity that we have to be peacemakers. If you're in the midst of offering to God a gift, if you're in the midst of living life, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it looks like reconciling ourselves, going first to those that we know are angry with us, or that we have angered, and making things right. Matthew 18 kind of gives us this principle that first we should go to that person individually. Go and do our, our best to reconcile with them. If they are unable to with one person, you can bring others into this and you can and, and, and bring other brothers and sisters in Christ, other believers with you to help reconcile with them. But with everything our desire is to make things right. In Romans chapter 12, verse 18, it's a reminder to us that if possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with all. And this is hard for us. This is hard for me to think about if I desire to live at peace with you, but I can't make peace with you. 
Jesus is the instructions this morning about going to the person and making things right. It, it requires us to take steps towards peace, but it doesn't guarantee that peace will be had. This is the hardest thing for me. I like people. I want to be in right relationship with people. And sometimes when I go to somebody and they reject my peace offering, they reject my apology, they reject my forgiveness, and all of a sudden it's still broken. God, Jesus is instructing us here, let us make every effort to bring peace, to make things right. If we're going to the Lord in, in worship, make sure we go to the other person and do our best, try our head hardest, make steps toward bringing that relationship into wholeness. And so this isn't a guarantee that all their relationships will be whole because we follow Jesus. This is a guarantee that you may have some work to do and that there may be some people that you need to call after service today and begin to make some steps towards making things right. We aren't responsible for their willingness to forgive, but we are responsible for taking steps towards right relationships. Forgiveness and reconciliation is a decision that we have to make. And I was thinking about teaching on steps towards forgiveness. I was thinking about who we are as people, that we are body, soul, and spirit. Our spirit is made alive in Christ, and, and our journey as a believer is that our, the spirit of God comes alive in us, and, it works, and he works himself through all of us. That's how we read in, in Romans chapter 12 that we are living sacrifice and he's making us pure, he's renewing our mind. And, and our personhood, our soul is made of our mind, will, and emotion. This is an important step in understanding, bringing reconciliation, making things right with others. That we are our mind, our will, and our emotion. Many times we don't enter into making things right with others because we tend to stay in our emotions, our feelings. I don't feel like making things right with them. They wrong me. They hurt me. We stay in our feelings, and this oftentimes is a boundary, a border between our obedience to God and our living as a sacrifice and our staying apart from God. So our mind, every time I work uh, with people and I walk people through, um, through forgiveness and through healing of relationship, I encourage them first that they have to make the decision from their mind and say, I want or I need to be obedient to Christ. I'm going to make a decision to be right with God and I'm going to make a decision to release forgiveness to the other person. Now, you guys know this, uh, our, our will or your desire, sometimes my desire says to me, well, I don't want to. Right? My mind makes a decision, I need to forgive, I need to, I need to make it right, I, I need to be obedient to God, and my, and, and my desire is like, nah, I don't want to do that. But I promise you, every time we make a decision, and we stick to the decision, our will will follow, and our emotions will often be like the boost. It will follow along like a train. Our, 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 our decision brings us forward, it changes our will, and our emotions oftentimes are the last things to get on board. The problem is, many times, and I'm guilty of this too, I allow my emotions to be the front of my train, and if that happens, man, I will never and to reconciliation. I mean, if I'm just honest, right? And my emotion, uh, they tell me, nope, they hurt me, nope, I'm, uh, I'm mad about that still. But we have to make a decision in our minds. We have to be determined. I am going to be obedient to Christ. I am going to forgive this individual. I am going to go make things right with this individual. I am determined to be obedient to Christ because my obedience to Him is better than my sacrifice. It's a hard thing to follow. But Jesus 
gives us instructions to follow him in obedience. That our obedience in our life is greater than sacrifice. So let's read again this chapter in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First to be reconciled to your brother and then to come and offer your gift. Jesus is instructing us that obedience to Him uh, and living like Him is more important than our great gifts that we can give to the Lord. Greater than our Sunday morning attendance, greater than our offering and its size, greater than our 20 plus days of, in a row of reading our, our Bible plan. It, it's greater than serving at the Chi Alpha Breakfast yesterday morning. Greater is obedience to Him in every area of our life. And remember from the beginning of the message, God exists in relationship. He creates in relationship. And His rules and instruction uphold relationships. So we should be a people, like we said when we studied the Beatitude, we should be a people who are peacemakers who are going after, who are making a decision of our, uh, we're making a decision and we're doing everything we can to bring our relationship into right standing. Go into them. Hey, I've heard through the grapevine, you're, you're upset with me. Hey, the other day, this happened and it offended me. Going to the individual and making steps towards right relationships. It's of utmost importance to the Father because He exists in relationship. He created us for relationship and He Himself made steps to reconcile us to Himself, to build relationship with Himself. He sent His Son, Jesus, to live obedient, to take our place so that our relationship may be made right. And now His, his instructions to us is to live in that same manner. When we study uh, study a little bit further, we'll find that uh, in Matthew, sorry, in the Sermon on the Mount, we study a little bit further. We'll find that Jesus also gives instructions about prayer, and in the prayer, he says, "If you are unable to forgive your brother or your sister, that your heavenly Father, your Father who is in heaven, will not be able to forgive you." We are to live in response to who God is and what He's done. And God has made our relationship with Him whole. And He desired that we be people who also focus on being obedient to Him by making our relationship with others right first. Then we bring our offering and our sacrifice and our worship to the Lord. This morning we have an opportunity to respond to the message. And I was speaking, I, I was thinking about, man, the different broken relationships in my life, different places of anger that I have to deal with. And I know that you may also have, the Holy Spirit may have brought to you attention of relationship in your life. That He is desiring you through this message to make things right, to make attempts, to make steps towards peace with them. I want to encourage you during our time of reflection this morning to ask the Lord, who is it that you are asking me to make things right with? And I believe that for many of us, there will be a name or two that God brings to your attention that you need to go to and, and take steps towards making things right. Asking forgiveness. Bringing love into an area where anger existed. But I also believe there's an opportunity for us to make our lives right with the Father. I mentioned many times the good news of Jesus this morning, that, that He lived a life that we couldn't live. He submitted Himself fully to the Father so that we may find forgiveness and grace. 
And so this morning, the second opportunity that we have first is to ask God, is there a relationship that I need to make right? Is there a relationship that is getting in the way of my obedience to you? And secondly, though, is to say, Father, I receive your forgiveness through Jesus this morning. And so I want to give us an opportunity to reflect on those two questions this morning. And I will be up here this morning. I would love to pray with you if you're saying, hey, Pastor, I would love if you would pray with me. Pray, pray with me through this relationship. Pray with me through this anger that I have held up within me. I would love to do that. So let's spend the next five minutes praying. One, asking God, who is it that I need to make right with? Who is it that I need to reconcile myself with? And two, Lord, forgive me. Lord, make me right with you so that our relationship may be pure and may be sustained. Let's pray. Father, I am so grateful for your message this morning that Jesus, you speak to us and you speak to us out of relationship. And God, that you desire to make our relationships whole, that you desire to bring love, to bring compassion, and to, to rid us of anger. And so, God, I pray for each one of us in this room, God, that we would have boldness to make steps toward reconciliation, that we would have boldness to take steps towards peace. And, God, I, I pray that you would give us specifically who we need to go to and that we may make things right, that our offering to you, our life of worship to you, would be pleasing. In Jesus' name, amen.